about. Maybe even higher. You know, the only thing we have going for us is wood, right? Wood heat. So I say this to you because by and large, in any reservation community you're dealing with a reserve, they're saying you guys need new jobs to take care of your economy. And the argument that I make, which is the argument that all of you I'm sure understand, is that why you got a leak that represents 50% of your economy in your community between food and energy. You all understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So why would you want to bring in new money that's just going to fall out again? How about you plug the leak, right? So this is basically the fundamental strategy of organizing that we work on in my community. Because you're less susceptible to bad ideas if you're strong, mm -hmm. right? But you still obviously have to continue your national and international organizing work to you know, win your battles because you're not on your own. But at the same time, your communities are healthier and don't need and aren't pressured for new jobs and employment if you got control over your food and energy economies. And the position I take as in, in our First Nations and you know in our territories is you can't say you're sovereign if you can't feed yourselves. Right? Last on this, but you know this problem. Th third of the people on my reservation have diabetes. How's the data up here? About the same? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And this is the BMI index of my kids' school. By eighth grade, 50% of the kids are obese. What's that? Bad food, too much TV, right? No fruit. The we. You guys have the we up here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that yeah, that thing, that thing. I'm waiting for them to come out with the, the wild rice harvesting wheat. That'll be like the perfect example of how messed up shit is, huh? Let's just go rice on the wheat. Anyway, this is your solution right here, which you know. I'm going to talk about the implications of this. This is Ivan Curry with a, with a Lakota squash. Um, my community, um, we decide, you know, so my organization at White Earth, we sort of buy back our land about 20 years ago, and we only have 1,400 acres we bought back. But on that land, we grow, we have maple syruping operation, and we grow a lot of organic food. And then we have a wild rice processing mill, and we have, a, I'll, sh I'll show you at the end my wind turbine, okay? So why I tell you this is that this is a model of, of the recovery of a local economy, which has implications for communities besides ours. And the thing about this squash that uh, Ivan is holding there is that that squash uh, is higher in antioxidants and pretty much everything. Okay, here you go. This is a heritage squash. And um, this squash, this is what it is. Um, hominy corn, which I'm going to show you in a minute, is high in carbohydrates and protein, has 47% of the recommended daily value for fiber, 33% of the recommended daily value for the B vitamin thiamin and has about half the calories of market corn. A rickerous squash, which is similar than this, contains 13% of the daily recommended value for fiber, 64% of the RDV for vitamin A, half the calories and double the magnesium and calcium of the market equivalent. Potawatomi lima beans low in fat, B vitamins, 24 grams of fiber, and 21 times the antioxidants found in market beans. So why am I telling you this? Because a couple of things. First, our indigenous seeds, which of course we have to battle from getting Monsanto mess them up, right? Mm -hmm. And in this country, the uh, these access to these heritage seeds is, is largely about five seed companies, right? Your numbers are down. They're worse than in the US. But you're getting these seed savers organizations back. Um, these seed savers are, are coming back. But these varieties exist. And they're what you want to grow if you're going to go to the trouble of farming or gardening, right? <laughs> Don't mess up with, with other stuff. The other thing about that squash is his father gave me that squash or one like it. And I ate that squash. He gave it to me in October and I ate it in May. Mm -hmm. And so why I'm telling you that is because some of these squash are tough guys. And that's what you call a low carbon food. You understand what I'm saying? Because I didn't have to can it. I didn't have to freeze it. It just hung out for that period of time. <laughs> it's a perfect storage unit. So I repeat this because part of our strategy has to be the decolonization of our taste buds. So we turn to, you know, we turn to our old foods because those are the those are the, the foods you want. 
you know, and uh, you know whether it is in, in uh, small raised bed gardening in, the, in your front of your house, yanking up your lawn, or community gardening. These are the guys you want. These these heritage guys are uh, you know a lot of your answer. This is our corn restoration project from our region. Um, turns out that uh, some of you guys up here, I mean, us guys, the Ojibwe's um, push corn um, 100 miles north of Winnipeg. So what's that mean? Some you know pretty good agrobiodiversity is what that means. Corn, of course, is what 8,000 varieties of it. Turns out if it's from microclimates, these are ours that we grow in my community. Well, we grow these too. And so we started on this kind, which is a flip corn, like a hominy. Do you guys all know what hominy is? Yeah. Like the soup corns, right? It's like a soup corn, right? And we started with this one. It's the Bear Island flip corn. It, it, I got this much from a seed bank, and I got fields now. And this is Jonesy Miller from Menominee with, my, with the corn we got from Bear Island. And it grows about this tall. And it doesn't require irrigation, doesn't require um, fertilizer, although we have good soil. It is frost resistant and drought resistant. And when a, a sear wind, a big strong winds come through, Monsanto's Roundup Ready field tipped over, but that corn did not. So the reason I'm telling you that is because this is the kind of corn you want in a time of climate change. And this is the kind of corn, but our food security as communities is very low. You have to go past farmer's market and boutique growing. You need to be able to actually feed your communities. And these are essential strategies for organizing. That's why I'm, I'm you know, telling you this. You know, and however it is, extending your, I had some other slides, extending your seasons, what you guys got to do up here with low, you know, with uh, greenhouses or whatever. This pink lady, flower corn, we grow that. Someone asked me why we grow it, I said it's, Pretty. <laughs> Fantastic corn. And this is a really cool corn called Pawnee Eagle Corn. You see why they call it Eagle Corn? Yeah. Uh, awesome. And I just tell you this story quickly that the Pawnees, they live in, uh, they, they start up on the Missouri River, they move down to Nebraska, and they live there pretty good. They have these corn varieties, and corn in, our, in, in that community like ours is a, a part of, um, and, and I think you, people were talking about it earlier, so they call it like cosmogenealogy, which is, uh, we're related, you know? And uh, that it's, it's not a commodity, mm -hmm. it's a part of a spiritual tradition. And in this case, uh, that, their corn is that. And um, they, they did well with their corn, and then what happened is, is that the, the, uh, you know, the settlers came and they actually got on pretty good with the settlers. The Pawnees did, they call them kind of like a AAA. You know, the settlers wagon break down, Pawnee fix it, horse lame, Pawnee fix it. You know, whatever, they all got on pretty good. And then the government came in and forced them out. Made them walk to Oklahoma, a lot of the Pawnees died. And they brought their varieties with them and they didn't grow. And so they perished. And that they got less and less and less. And then about 10 years ago, they decided to try to grow out those varieties and they, um, they could not grow them because they didn't belong in Oklahoma. And so this woman who ran a, a, um, a museum in the town that they had come from, Kearney, Nebraska, had called to ask if they could uh, grow the corn, their varieties there. And so they debated a long time, their elders, about if they could send their seeds someplace else. Well, they sent their seeds home and the seeds flourished. And what she said is that the seeds remember the land they came from. And so the descendants of the settlers grew out these varieties with the Pawnees. And now they have their, their enough back. They can't quite have feasts yet because it takes like five to 10 years to grow back your seed stock. So I'm telling you, get going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you got that message on this. Get going. And now they are good. And last year, last year they had Welcome Home Pawnee Days in Kearney, Nebraska, and 8,000 people came. Wow. That's cool, huh? So I tell you that too because in this case, corn is a form of corn offered a form of redemption. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And that people make history, and and people recover. Um, you know, just relations by making, you know, change in history is